Our scripture for this morning comes from a time that was becoming so far from God. The kings that had been reigning over Israel were pulling people further and further away from God and more and more into the worship of false gods. And so in that time, God raised up prophets to speak to them, to tell them that they were on the wrong path, that they were following the wrong people, the wrong gods. And this account tells of one time in which one of God's prophets was given a miracle in the, the provision of God. So we read today from 1 Kings 17, verses 1 through 16. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishba in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here, Turn eastward and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me a piece of bread, please. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for, for me from what you have and bring it to me, and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry, until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her, so there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. I love these kind of passages that are found um, in Scripture, oftentimes in the Old Testament, because people were prompted, were moved to do things that God had ordained without even really knowing God, without worshiping God, but because a man of God spoke they, they followed. And so she followed the directions. The, the woman who was in Zarephath followed the directions of Elijah without knowing what was going to happen, but trusting that as a man of God, he knew what he was saying. And so in this whole thing, we see not just the miracle of the provision that God gave to Elijah, food and, and water for the years that he was in the, the wilderness, but then also the provision for the widow and her son for a very long time. And so we rejoice with that, and we are thankful for these moments in Scripture that share just that with us. We follow me into a time of prayer. Lord, your words are so rich in examples just like that, where we see how many ways and how many times you have provided for your people. Some of them are fabulous, like parting the waters of the Red Sea, and some of them are providing meat and bread for a man all by himself in the wilderness. And so there's no limit to what you can do, and there's no limit to the ways in which you can reach out to your people and do miraculous things with and for them. And so as we go into the time of the message this morning, we just are so grateful to have these words and to have them fleshed out 
bias for Pastor Mike with the message that you've given for him to share today. And we thank you so much for all of your word and your works and just who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. I gotta get faster. <clears throat> what a great day. Glad that you're here worshiping with us at Marion Methodist. Glad that you're part of us on the as the church online. Um I just um, and invite you here, of course, always. I, I was so excited before church. You know, there were some students sitting back over there behind the altar where I was a moment ago and feverishly writing. I didn't know. I said, maybe they're making some notes in their journal. Maybe, uh, um, maybe they're writing notes about the praise team that's warming up. And then I, I got over there. And I found this. And... There's pictures of uh, dogs with unicorn horns and what appears to be a tortoise. And then, for some reason, the word no is on there. So I hope that wasn't about what's to come next, right? But if you're ever looking for an artist, I think her name's Lou. Uh, she's nearby. Lou's here somewhere. Uh, so you, I, I thought that was kind of fun. Um, She's an art. You, you grew her. Uh, I know. Yeah. Uh, it's beautiful. But um, this afternoon, we do have the Bell Choir concert at 4 o'clock this afternoon. Invite all of you back. I, I kind of made light of it, but it's really, if you really want to become a, a member of the Bell Choir, maybe you're an empty nester and you're saying, no, I need a new challenge in my life. Or maybe you, you know, you've been working at home for so long, and you're like, I need to get out for a little bit. Uh, and maybe you have these two skills. You can do this. And you can go one, two, three, four. If you have those two skills, Mary Lee can teach you the rest. And we really do, um, even though you see sometimes when you're here some of the same faces there, that doesn't mean they want, don't want new faces. You're invited. Maybe your whole family should join the little kid bell choir and, and come and have it a family activity. I don't know, but we, we think this is one of those ministries that really uh, draws us. It's one of our niches. We're one of the only churches that really have this kind of effectiveness in it. So come join it. And uh, if you want to see a little bit more about it, I invite you to bring your friends. It's a very accessible uh, activity. And Mary Lee's passion for a long time has been the food bank. Um, so if you can, bring a can of food. All right. So today's message, we continue through our Miracles, Believing What is Hard to Believe series. And of course, as it's been the last few weeks, we start with a quiz. Are you ready for the test? Yes. All right, yes. Let's take a look at that first question. The first question is, how many miracles did God perform using the prophet Isaiah? 16, 12, 3. These are harder, aren't they? No one can count that high. What did you come up with? Oh, somebody said B. 16. How many miracles did God use using the prophet Elijah? He performed 16. Maybe not as familiar with the prophet Elijah, but guess what? Elijah then gives his mantle of blessing. And now, this is, a, this is not going to appear on the screen. This is a thinking job. because Some of you didn't get that one right. But looking at that answer, when Elijah went up on the chariots of fire to, to heaven, right before that, he asked a double portion of his blessing on the new prophet Elisha. A double blessing. So how many, how many miracles do you think God performed for the prophet Elisha? Yes, all right. So if you missed the first one, you've redeemed yourself. All right, next question. How did Elijah raise the widow's son from the dead? He wept and wept over several hours. He stretched himself over him three times. He poured water over his body, or he breathed the Holy Spirit in them. Which one? B is correct. He stretched himself out over him three times. All right. Which of these miracles, next question, appear in Scripture? John the Baptist is restored to life, a poisoned wine is purified, restoring an ox to life, or catching a fish with a coin in its mouth? D is the correct answer, yeah. So some of you got four out of four this week, right? One of you got four out of four. <laughs> Just me, because I had the notes? All right, all right. So welcome back to our, our series on... Uh, Miracles, believing the hard 
to believe. Our focus during this series has not been on the how God articulated all these miracles, but really on, on this threefold approach. Um, what happened, which is to say, what does the text say? What does the scripture say actually happened, the events that transpired? Uh, why, why did it happen? What are God's motives behind this? And why are Christians believe it? Which is really us digging into what is the Lord saying to us and what are we supposed to do about it? So let's start with that methodology. What happened? What happened? Well, Elijah prophesies that no rain will fall in Israel for three years, and it doesn't. That's what happens. Incredible hardship comes on the people, but there's a purpose and reason behind it. Elijah is um, the first in a long line of prophets that God sends to Israel to call them back into relationship with him. They had, they had received the blessing of, of the promised land. They'd received the blessing of a kingdom, and yet they had started to stray away uh, with great sincerity from God. And Ahab is the king, anointed king of Israel. And he's a wicked dude. And, and he needs, from God's perspective, a dramatic intercession that comes with a reprimand from him. And so God deploys this prophecy through Elijah to say that there's going to be no rain and not even any dew from the ground until Elijah says so. And once Elijah gives that prophecy to Ahab, God takes Elijah into the wilderness, far away from where Ahab is. And then, in a very gross and disgusting part of this miracle, God sends ravens to feed Elijah. Yummy right? I'm not a bird person. I mean, I got to tell you, I saw Chris in here earlier. Chris, I love the Chick-fil-A sandwich. I do have a question, though. Sorry. I love the Chick-fil-A, but I struggle with this. Do you, do you have this problem, too, if you go to Chick-fil-A and get breakfast, and you get, like, a chicken breast and an egg that you're eating, like, a whole family at once? I don't know. Um, <laughs> they did it. I didn't. I just... You know, the mind goes places. Well, let's go back to these ravens. <laughs> Never eaten a raven, so we're safe. But, okay, so Elijah's out there in the wilderness. There's no concierge service. There's no DoorDash, right? And maybe worse yet, these styrofoam boxes take out, carry out things that hadn't been developed yet. So, so this is particularly nasty to me because like the birds are bringing him bread and meat and they can only carry him in those creepy little claws they have or, or that beak and so there's like bird spit on him and stuff like that and I don't know you know I, I, I'm not trying to be funny about this I just think it's really super gross what God does here you know but th that happens sometimes because he does you know have a guy live in a whale's gut for a few weeks to, or a few days too but the ravens are not chosen randomly. The ravens supporting Elijah are first unclean. It mentions that in scriptures. And secondly, they're completely undependable. But for years, they're going to serve Elijah. They're undependable. We see this in Genesis 8 because Noah from the ark sends out a raven and it never comes back. Just keeps flying. And, and so there's this very odd choice here. The point of which is that God has help where we least expect help to come from. He provides for us in ways that, that are beyond our narrow definitions or our ideal expectations. We think things will come this way and God brings them this way, which is why ravens are deployed by God. It's not that Elijah made friends with them, and said, now, go get me some food. It's that God deploys them to bring them food, him food that doesn't seem to be plentiful anywhere else. And then the wadi, the creek, dries up, and God sends Elijah to a widow in Zarephath. Now, that's important. Zarephath is a place that's way up north, way up even north of Tyre, in, in just outside of Israel. So he, he, she's, she's a widow that's not Israeli, and so that's outside of his, his faith and his race. And when he approaches her, he, he asks her for something to eat, a drink and something to eat. Hey, can I have a drink? And by the way, while you're out getting me a drink, can I have, um, can I have a piece of bread? And she says, you know, we don't have any foodstuffs left, 
and I was just getting ready to cook my son and my last supper. We're going to eat it, and then we're going to die. Elijah says, oh, I'd like it anyway. And she trusts him. A widow trusts Elijah and is blessed with this infinite daily supply. She's in a situation where all of her resources are gone. Maybe you've been in one too. And she has to think to herself and she has to ask, am I getting hustled by a religious weirdo? I mean, there's some weirdos in the world, right? If, if you don't think there's any, And religious weirdos can be like a lot. So she has to think, am I getting hustled by a religious weirdo or is the God of Israel really speaking to me? And she chooses the latter. But she had to choose. She had to choose. Feed my kid and myself and die or feed this religious man from outside my race and religion. And her simple act of faith produced a miracle of amazing abundance. The Lord told her, lied through Elijah, that she would not run out of her supply. Every time she took a dip out of the flour, it replaced itself. Every time she poured some of her oil, it replaced herself. And so all of those years of the drought, she had more than enough for herself and her son. So that's what happened. Why did it happen? Elijah is sent to rescue Israel from moral and spiritual decline. King Ahab had married Jezebel. And Jezebel is the daughter of a Baal-worshipping king. And Baal is an idol, one of the things we're not supposed to do. And Ahab then had begun to worship and to serve Baal. And he also erected a pole, a worship pole, to worship Asherah, who's a goddess who also gives miracles. Now, if you're a Seinfeld fan, it's not a Festivus pole. It's an Asherah pole. I said that in the first service, and they... And it clearly wasn't as funny coming out as what it was on Thursday when I thought of it. <laughs> so you've got Baal worshiping happening. You've got people worshiping at this Asherah pole. And because the king is doing it, the people follow him. And this is the king of Israel. The king of Israel to whom the commandments, the first one is, do not put any other gods before me. The second of which is, do not make any statutes that look like anything in the sky or on the earth or in the waters, you know, like a cow, like Baal, right? Do not bow before them or worship them, for I, the Lord, am a jealous God, meaning if you do so, I shall do something about it. Think of it. Here were the Israelites, the people chosen by God, and they knew they were chosen by God because he kept telling them, you're my chosen people. I set you aside. I give you a special area. I give you a land flowing with milk and honey. I send uh, all the laws and the prophets to you. They're set apart by God, and they know him. And in their past, they have not had to worship him because he's been face to face with them from time. And yet, their king, the one that was supposed to lead them and remind them daily of this, this kind of, uh, you, know, you know, this beautiful relationship was strained and he was worshiping other gods. And so Elijah is to confront the man who led Israel into, in, in, into evil. And Ahab is already killing off anyone that would speak for God. He's doing that before Elijah got to him. But Elijah cares not at all. He's not going to let anyone else control his, his uh, message. He has no lack of boldness, and he is going to represent God no matter what. And in the very next chapter, which I think is one of the most exciting chapters of the, of the Bible, I would encourage you to go read uh, 1 Kings 18, because there's, also, there's a great, wonderful story, and there's also a little bit of humor in there, because Elijah is going to lead the showdown between God and the prophets of Baal and Asherah. The reason for this story, we can't miss this because it's a little context, Baal is believed to be the God of rain and bountiful harvest. So God has taken both of those away. No rain, no harvest. We even know that in Iowa. No rain, no harvest. So Elijah says the one God is going to pull all that rain away and it's not just be for a couple minutes. 
It's going to be for several years, and the drought begins. And then God takes Elijah into the wilderness to this strange land for protection. Now, can, God say, can Elijah say God is good in the midst of this? He's out there getting fed by nasty, irresponsible, typically unclean birds. The water's drying up. He's way far from his homeland. Can he possibly in that lonely wilderness say God is good? Well, I believe yes, because the famine was universal. It was affecting every single person that lived on that part of the earth, and God was giving him sustenance. Yeah, it, was, it had a little raven spit on it, but God was giving it to him every single day. I'm so sorry about that. I just can't get over the raven thing, all right? We all have stuff to work out here. Some of you are still back at the Chick-fil-A thing, but um, and we'll pray for you. But So, so that, that's the what and the why it happened but why are Christians to believe it? This hard to believe miracle. At the height of, of rebellion against him, God responds with words and action. See, here's what you know. Regardless of wealth or military strength or the, or the, the, maj uh, the majestic nature of your kingdom, there's not a single ruler in the world, past, present, or that one to come, that has a defense against drought. None of them have a defense against drought. If it doesn't rain, it doesn't rain. And so often, you know, we say, we, you know, we throw our thoughts and prayers towards someone. We, we care enough to, to care, and, and we pray towards things, and that's so very important. And God says, all that plus, I'm not going to let them have any room, rain. We're, 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 they'll never get out of my sight, and I'll continue to care for them, and I'll raise them up, and... There is this significant action of no rain. We have in our lives no defense against certain things. There, there are things that come into our lives, situations and circumstances, and we long for the action of God, just like all of those in Israel long for God to reverse his actions and to give them some rain. And I just came by as we prepare for communion to, to remind you that God will, will respond during our season of moral decline and spiritual decline when we take the step of faith. We have to take the step of faith. Um, when we take the step of faith, God provides sustenance for us. Spiritual provision to get by day by day in hungry times. In dry and, and, and thirsty times. We all, and those of you that are joining us, uh, you know, from different places across the U.S. and maybe the world and, and the worship on the church online, you know this. Those of you here know this, that there have been moments in our lives where we're drinking full out from the fountain of God's blessings and there's other times where our spirit's so dry, where we just need a, a, a sip of God's blessing. And, and I'm here to tell you that the story of Elijah out there in the wilderness is, is a reminder that God gives us sustenance, spiritual provision to get us by day by day, whether the time is a high mountain or a low valley in our spirituality. I, I'm here to tell you, and I've had conversations even as, as, as late as 20 minutes before this worship sign, that God will be providing signs and wonders, but most importantly in your life, he will give you the vision to see God in your every day. He gives you the opportunity that if you look, you shall see and not mistake God's presence in your very life and understand that you are ever accompanied in life. God never leaves you out there all alone. He takes you even through the valley of the shadow. Whatever our wilderness is, we are never walking alone. God is always there. So faith is, is the step between promise and assurance. We, we may not see a solution until we take a step of faith. That's always where it is. You know, and so it comes to us, this question, have you ever been or are you now in a situation where all your resources are gone? Like that widow in Zarephath, there, there's no more flour, there's no more oil. Now to you, it might be something else. You might say there's no more hope, there's no more uh, sustenance, there's no more money, there's no more joy, there's no, I don't know, but some of our resources get dried out by that and we ask then to that question, have you ever been in a spot where all your resources are gone, where the question then comes to you, will you like the widow go, f the w the widow go forward anyway? E even when you think there's nothing, will you move forward? Because the reason to believe in the hard to believe 
is that God provides for those who trust him. Not always what we expect, but God shall always provide for those who trust him. I know everybody here, everybody worshiping far from here wants a substantial miracle in their lives. We do. We, we said that in the first few weeks. Do you want a miracle? Everybody wants one. We, we do. We, we need miracles of healing. We need miracles of relationship building. We need all these kind of miracles. And, and what, what the scriptures that we read today show us is that God allows a trial from time to time so we can see his power. I'm always reminded, and I've told this story before, and some of you probably remember it, because I know you hear, hear and remember everything that comes out of this pulpit, yeah? Okay. Well, then you tell the story. A story about a fellow walking in the wilderness. He doesn't see it, but he comes upon a hole, and poof, down he goes. Deep into this hole. He's okay. It's soft down there and all that kind of stuff. He starts crying out, help, 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 help. And a guy hears him. He says, I see where you're at. I can get you some help. I'll be right back. I got a couple things that will help you. He goes back to wherever he has his stuff and he finds a ladder and he drops it down the hole. He drops it down the hole and the guy scrambles it up, but he's still 10 feet from the top. He says, just a second, I have more to help you. He's standing at the top of the ladder. He says, I can't get out. He says, wait, I've got more. He throws a rope to him. He ties the rope around himself, braces his feet at the top of the, the hole and says, okay climb up he says it's just outside my reach it's about six inches above where i am and the fellow on the top says listen i've given you everything i've got i threw down the rope i dropped the ladder in you're going to have to jump reach and grab you're going to have to jump reach and grab it's just a little bit you don't have to go that far this story reminds us that the resources are here. The resources are here to know God. And the question is, will we leap, reach, and grab so that we might receive what God would have us do? Every miracle performed through Elijah began with the miracle of being able to know God. We're given the same blessing every single day of our lives. Here today even, the opportunity to discern what, discern what God will do with that knowledge and relationship is before us. And so we simply need to, as we come down for Holy Communion, we need to grapple with the fact, w w am I willing to be one who knowing what God will give me will simply look at all those resources and take that one step of faith that allows us to reach out, to leap into him, and grab with all of our might so that he can pull us up and through whatever's in front of us. I pr pray that on you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I want to uh, invite all of you to Holy Communion. Um, it's not a required thing, but in the Christian church, we believe, and in the, this part of the Christian church, Methodism, where you've come to worship this morning, we believe in what's called an open table of communion. So we don't bar anyone from communion. If you're desirous of communion, you're, you're welcome to come and eat at the Lord's table. If you don't know, oh, I'm from another denomination or something, um, if you're uncomfortable, stay where you're at, and we'll be done in a few minutes. But if you're from another denomination you want this or if you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior then this is for you we take communion in a very simplistic method there will be two stations one at the end of both of these aisles out here where someone will be holding a basket of bread and uh, one of us will be holding a cup and you simply with your own hand take a piece of bread dip it in the cup receive it and then come forward to the uh, altar rail and pray as long as you'd like now if you, if you need gluten-free elements, we have them. They're here in the center aisle. Um, they're a little bit hard in this current day to get a hold of, so if you don't need the gluten-free, but you still want the cup that you don't have to touch things with other people's hands, um, we have those here, those, those cups that have the thin layer of cellophane and, then, and, and the bread and the juice in them, and they're here, so simply just come here, and then you can uh, pray at the altar rail. So there's three methodologies, um, intinction, um, the gluten-free and, of course, the others. And um, I want to institute the communion elements so we can get to this in our last couple minutes. Uh, less words, more Holy Spirit. On the last night of his life, our Lord Jesus took a loaf of bread common to his day, broke it, offered it to his disciples that were gathered there with him and said, take and eat. 
For this bread represents my body. And just as you've seen or will see my body broken before you, um, so you've seen this bread broken before you. And every time you gather together, eat this bread in memory of me. And after the supper was completed and everyone had had their fill, the Lord Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks to his Father in heaven. And then he offered it to his disciples saying, take and drink. For in this cup is the wine, which, which represents my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And every time you eat bread, drink this wine in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of all of God's mighty acts of salvation, we eat the bread and drink, drink the wine, praising God all the while for his magnificent presence and his fantastic substance of our lives. So brothers and sisters, give us just a second uh, to get in place and then come and eat and drink at your Lord's table.